Hi Kavi, this is the first video of a new series of interview for Best Your Life uh, dedicated to the top session bass player in the world. So it's a pleasure for me to start with a friend, with a great musician. Welcome to Bass Your Life, uh, top uh, session player. Thanks so much, Mario. It's, uh, it's so good to see you. Uh, it was the 2012 uh, that we met, uh, you, are, you were playing with Luciano Di Gabue in Italy. That's right. Yeah, we were in uh, Lampedusa and yes. uh, yeah, and um, it was that was an amazing, unforgettable experience and such a great cause that we were there for. Let's dive in and start. We have uh, so many questions. First one, in your educational path, what uh, topics you have studied and what uh, uh, advices you received uh, from your mentors, which you found most useful in your career? For me, I was, I was self-taught originally, you know, I started, I started playing the bass as, um, I started playing music in, in, in elementary school by playing the saxophone. And, uh, I found my way into the bass when I was around 12 years old and I started listening to ter certain types of music like rock music and punk and reggae and uh the sound of the bass was was so profound and um i ended up with a um uh, a really inexpensive cheap uh fender music master bass and i taught myself out of play um and i also had some some other musicians young musicians in high school that showed me a lot of little things and from there i just kind of kept going something that i talk about a lot as far as mentors i grew up in denver colorado denver is a great city there's a lot of great musicians there and it was a great time when i was growing up to uh, play a lot of music with really close friends there was a really good scene of young musicians around my age at the time who were all very, very good musicians and really driven and they were hungry to learn and hungry to play. And the other thing that we had that we were very lucky about is we had a lot of venues and places to play. So we could play concerts, we could play shows with original music kind of really quickly. And then the other thing that we had, like you're talking about were mentors were some just older musicians that growing up in Denver that were fantastic. There was a trumpet player named Ron Miles, who was a real hero of a lot of ours. And um, he always and still makes some of the greatest music and just kind of has created a path for himself in the, the world of art and music that's really honest and full of hard work and dedication so it was really nice to uh see how someone like that could create amazing music and still stay inspired as an older musician and then eventually for me pretty quickly i i became a busy a busy bass player you know because that is the joke you know about <laughs> bass players you know yeah. it's like yeah, yeah. one of uh, you know, maybe we should share some share some bass player jokes because I, I'm sure you have some too. And <laughs> tell us. Well, yeah, well, the famous one. Well, one of them is uh, a father gives his son a bass for his birthday, and he says, "I've also given you some lessons." And the son says, "Great." The son goes to the first lesson. The first lesson, and he comes back, and his dad says, "What did you learn today?" He says, well, dad, I learned the E string and I learned the A string. And the dad goes, oh, very nice. And then the next week, the dad goes, son, what did you learn today? And the son goes, I couldn't make it. I had a gig. <laughs> <laughs> the bass player for sure. <laughs> yeah, but um, that's how it was for me. Pretty quickly, I got really busy in Denver as a young teenager playing bass with reggae bands and salsa bands and hip hop and you know original music there was some music that was creative music and rock music and and eventually after a while i made my my way to uh i eventually st went to a conservatory for a couple of years i don't know i mean for for musicians the thing to really understand is that 
um, your ment you should always search for mentors, always, like at every stage. This question really relates to me now. I've got tons of mentors now that people who are older than me, but also people who are younger than me that I, I really admire. And that's kind of, that's what we do. That's what we're doing here on this site. That's, you know, it's like, you're always looking to people, but um, yeah, in college, college was a lot of university was a lot of practical application, tons of time working on the double bass and playing in the orchestra and doing that kind of stuff. But for me, a lot of the important information came from people that I saw that were working, you know, people, and you just saw how, how they behaved, you know, at a concert, at a gig, you know, there might've been people that who were older, who I listened to on albums when I was young, and we would be on a gig together and they would show up, they would show up before I did to the gig, you know, they were always prepared. You know, which makes you think that, oh, it's, That's you know, way. you never get too, you know, famous or, or successful to not stop being professional. You always have to be professional. Yeah, I think it's a, that's a long winded question. That was a long yeah. answer. But I think, that, but I think there's mentors are, are so important to, so important. to, yeah, to, to this, this, this path. What was your first uh, occasion that made you say, I finally entered a new an higher level of uh, circuit of musician was uh, was the first uh, approach to a big level from the band that you have in Denver. I mean, for me, and I always talk about this. I think for me, getting to every every level is really exciting. You know, for me, I always had this feeling that, and sometimes it's like naivete. Like sometimes it's like, but the feeling of, of getting to, getting to work with a great drummer is just, that's all you need. And then you go from there and then you see another situation where, but, um, you know, I don't know, like for me, early ones, early victories, and I call them small victories, you know, like early uh, ones. Okay. Yeah. We're getting to, yeah. And, um, but then, you know, down the road, I, I'm, you know, like for me, uh, it was getting to play with great musicians in Denver and then eventually getting to start our own bands and then eventually getting to open for bands like the roots and you know Modesky and Martin and Wood and then and then for me eventually getting to play on a gig with Ron Miles and then maybe and then it turns into auditioning to be able to move to uh to New York and get to study with a great bass player out there and then eventually it's and then it's you know or or it was like making a making a living as a bass player at 17 yes. years old you know it's like there's always these little things are a victory for you are victories yeah and and then later you know stuff comes along and it's like you appreciate it and you work really hard for it but it's just kind of part it's all part of the passage it's all part of and if you're not if you're not satisfied with that first victory You're yeah. never going to appreciate, you're never going to appreciate the bigger ones. Like, yeah. cause it's, it won't be worth it. The bigger ones won't be worth it. Cause it takes a long time to get to an opportunity to get to play with Luciano Ligabue or Sting or John Legend or Bruce Springsteen. It takes a long time to get there. So if you didn't have fun with all of those small victories, then you're not going to enjoy yeah. that other stuff. You know, it's just going to kind of be like, You know, because you can never expect to get to work with those people. You never expect that. Like you always, you have to enjoy like all the things the that you're doing. The moments, yeah. Uh, during uh, your career, what failures has taught you the most? Mm -hmm. What sad moments uh, um, was important for you? Yeah, there, there are a lot. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of sad moments. I mean, you know, I listen to myself playing bass 20 years ago and it's hard to it's it can be hard to listen to you know but I think it's important to take the moment seriously and this is from somebody who I didn't always take the moment really seriously like I learned to be professional I would I, I didn't start out as professional you know Because but you I, st I you start with with your friends so it was a uh, is uh, you know happy times with friends yeah yeah and it was yeah it was it was fun and But yeah, I had, there was a lot of experiences. I remember one time when I was 18, there's a great bass player who played, the great upright player who played bass with Ron. He was playing bass with Joe Bonner and Joe was a, a piano player. He died 
but he was a great jazz piano player. And I remember, um, you know, I remember like getting, you know, uh, going up on stage. Already, the older bass player would always have me sit in. He would always like ask me oh, to sit okay. in. And little by little, he would, you know, if he couldn't do a gig, he would have me do a little gig or something. And I remember getting, you know, called up on stage. It was at a really like uh, kind of a dive bar on Colfax in Denver. And it was probably like four people in the audience. And there was Joe playing amazing piano and, and Artie playing great bass and this drummer. And, and then Artie's like, come on up and sit in. And I was like, oh. Okay, you know, and I remember I came and sat in and, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's that whole thing where it's like, you know, what do you want to play? Like the guy says, what do you want to play? I didn't, I didn't really know any tunes. He says he threw this music in front of me and I kind of, I kind of could get it through it, but I didn't really read. And I remember halfway through the song, he's just like, motherfucker, can't you read? You know, like, <laughs> you know, and I was just like, ah, oh. and he's like, where's Artie? He's like, where's Artie? You know, oh. and, uh, and, uh, he talks. <laughs> yeah, it hurts. And I remember, I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of situations like that. I remember, yeah. I mean, you know, just things like that. I remember doing, I remember doing auditions. Like when I first moved to Los Angeles, my ears were pretty good. Like my ears were really developed. Like I had really, I, that was maybe four years later after that bad situation with, with Joe. But I remember first moving to LA and the big thing in LA was auditions for touring bands and you know i was in my early 20s and Perfect. a big yeah and a big a big artist is asking to go you know like has a tour and then you get you know it was like a cattle call it's like you and 10 other bass players and you show up and yeah for sure i've done so many <laughs> you've done so many yeah, yeah, yeah i know and and early on for me in those auditions i didn't take them seriously i was really like i and i i wish i had you know like I, you know i always had this kind of thing where it's like if they like me they like me you know <laughs> okay which is which it's, is it's, nice it's not, if it's it's not working every time <laughs> doesn't work every time <laughs> i would listen to the music on the way to the gig and you know not really take it seriously like i would kind of yeah. like oh it's the one chord going to the three yeah, I, and then it I goes know, to the six and but it's like the part the part is like that's what you know becoming a producer and and working on you know after years of working the, the on dates. records the details yeah it's like that bass line took it might have taken two days for them yeah. to figure out what works and if i show up and say oh it's just the three chord going to the six and blah 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 it's like Dude, what are you doing? Like, you know, I mean, all of my mistakes have been from not being prepared. It also comes from a feeling of kind of insecurity where it's like you don't want to show that that you're weak. So instead of doing the work, you don't do the work and you hope that they will see something in you. Like, I don't need this work. If you want to call me. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? It's not the truth. I've got a lot of stories like that, really. And some funny ones too. Like one of them was, I was 18 and uh, I didn't know how to read. I didn't, at the time, I could read on saxophone, but it was different. It's a different clef. It's a different, you know, and I was self-taught on the bass and, but I was pretty good. Like at 18, I could play, I could do all these things. And I was playing with older musicians. And, and so Berkeley had an audition where you can, you know, it's expensive. It's an expensive school. And, yes. um, and yeah, you know, I didn't have the money to afford the school. Um, so, so they have, but they have a scholarship that you can go and you audition for the scholarship and scholarship is pretty good. And so back then in the nineties, I made a tape, a cassette tape of my, you know, my bass playing, yes. which was with great people. And I'm, you know, doing my comfortable, like what I was comfortable with. And I sounded good, I guess. And I got invited to audition. And then that was when they said, okay, so what you should do is prepare a song to play. At the time, I wasn't playing a lot of jazz standard, but I was mostly doing kind of creative stuff and then the reggae and the salsa bands and just kind of bass playing with other people. I hadn't worked out solo versions of. I loved uh, John Coltrane's song, Naima. I love that song, it's a beautiful song. And so my version of Naima was playing the melody. <laughs> 
So like I worked it out and I had a tape, I had some friends. So I fly to Boston, I get to Boston, a friend of mine, a great drummer, and I flew to Boston, I forgot my tape. Not I have so an electric- Not so professional. Yeah, not so professional. <laughs> yeah, and show up to the audition. And you know, it's like sight reading. I've been kind of working, like kind of working on my sight reading and oh, you know, it's just eh, not so good. Chord chart reading, oh, good, not so good. And then he's like, okay, so play your song play the song you prepared and I was like okay here we go and I go no tape nothing I just go to you know just plug it in and I was like bang <laughs> be, be, be. and he goes he goes thank you very much thank you I was able to go to to Berkeley uh, three years ago, and I did a master class. One of the moderators was, was Victor Wooten and Steve Bailey. Steve Bailey. And, and I was about to go on stage and I was about to tell that story, like the story of the nervous and just playing that. And like right before I went on stage, I had my iPhone and I was learning Naima, you know? And I was like, that same panic came back, that same feeling. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, why am I doing this? You know, like, put that aside, put that mistake aside and then just come in, you know, like just what I learned from that is a lot, but <laughs> one of yeah. them is to really, you know, take the moment seriously and to also play the best version of you. We have uh, two questions you had just talked about. Uh, how important is sight reading in your uh, professional career? And how much is important your training, the ability to understand the song or if without the instrument? Yeah, they're both they're both so important. Um, I, for me, sight reading I really started developing, really developing probably you know right around when I was 19 or so, and just really that's I spent a lot of time playing an orchestra, studying double bass, and and uh, it's one of those skills like sight reading is like a it's a muscle that can get weak if you don't do it. And to be able to do it is great. It, for me, it just, all it does is it opens up opportunity. Sure, there are a lot of great musicians, like the best musicians in the world who never sight read, but for bass players and for someone like you and me, it's what you said earlier. It's like, we have to do so many different things to have a career. And if you don't learn how to sight read, you lose a lot of opportunities. The ability to read something for the first time, you know, I get called for, you know, movie sessions and, and you also have to be able to write. With Nibody, you don't uh, read anything. It's all about ears in, with the, your band. Yeah, so that was the other thing. Everybody in the band could sight read and, and read really well. Um, but we kind of had a rule in that band that that every, all of the music would be taught by ear. To be able to hear a song for the first time and just kind of go, oh, okay. Because that happens for me a lot in the studio. Oh, and so a lot of- Talk about this, it's important. You know, a lot of times I'll go into the studio and I'll work with an, with on a film or a, on a TV show and there's music. But a lot of times there's no music. And it's like, I'll be hired by a producer or by a, an artist to come in and as a bass player to play over, to, you know, play bass on their song. And a lot of times they've, they've you know, they've got a production there, like a good demo. And so you have to be able to hear it for the first time and kind of just hear what's happening to like, make a quick analysis of the song and say like, oh, okay, this is the one chord going to da, da, da. And I, like, it depends on the situation. Sometimes I never write anything down and I just sit there. It depends on how comfortable I am with the okay. artist or the, okay. or the producer. Sometimes I won't write anything down. I'll just kind of sit there and, and then boom, I'll just kind of like play it. And then maybe I'll make a mistake and like take me back, boom, I'll do it again. Okay. But, but then a lot of other times what I'll do is the second I hear it, I've got, you know, I've got one of these, yeah. you know, or, you know, the back of a napkin or something. And I just write bar lines. You are relative uh, here. So you sign uh, only first grade uh, five or uh, the real shorts. What I'll do is I'll do, I'll, I'll usually do, um, I, yeah, I don't have perfect pitch. Sometimes I, I can, I can get to pitches really quickly and, and you know, you probably the same where it's like you hear it, you can hear an E, yeah, an G, open E, yeah, you, you sure. can hear certain notes, I, they pop out. The G, the G, I don't know why I can hear the G. Is that, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> because I, I studied so many times with the, with the low G. 
And so a lot of times I'll, I'll just sketch out, I'll sketch like really quickly. And these are some of them, like, you know, for a record, you know, I'll just sketch out, Okay. you know, or, or if there's like a specific bass line, you know, I'll just sketch out the rhythm and I'll try to do that the first time through, like the first time that they play it yeah. so that the quickest possible, I'm ready to just start working on it. This is the topics of the interview. Become <laughs> a, 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 a first call a session player. It's important to pick up the song very fast and be ready to record straight away. Absolutely. Yeah, that's I, I've seen people do that in the studio and that's okay. how I learned to do that. It's like when you're in the studio, there's a lot of time where you're just sitting there. And so it's easy to just sit and like look at your phone and do all that stuff. But some people are really good at putting their phones away and just staying present in the moment because you get asked to, you know, to to be ready to play and you kind of yeah. need to be ready like you. Yeah. You know, but you know, it's, it's always a dance. Like you don't want to be too crazy about it, but you, yeah. you kind of always have to be ready. And um, you need to show somebody really quickly that they can trust you. So ways to do that are no, showing up. Yeah. You show up on time, you show, and you bring all of the equipment that you need and you bring like, you know, if this is an artist, that is in a certain style, you bring all the bases that are in that w world. Like if it's like a real kind of like roots rock thing, you're not gonna bring like a nine string bass. That's what establishes that trust with the producer or that trust with the artist, where it's like, they know that like, you know, Mario's great, Mario's yeah, set, he, he, Kaveh's, you know, ready. I don't have to worry he, about that. You had the wheel of the truck, you, yeah. you know how to drive. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, exactly. You, we can trust them to drive. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And, and so ears are really important and it's like ears, just like sight reading, you can always get better always. <laughs> yeah. And you can always develop it to another level and it can always you know, it can always yeah, get yeah. worse. It's a daily basis. Like, uh, like, you know, physical exercise. Yes. Like running you have to do Ex often. Yes. And yeah. we talk about the, the session. So now we are going <laughs> to the session. Tell uh, all uh, the gear freak uh, oh. we, we had uh, around uh, all the bases you bring, uh, all the preamp, uh, and if you mic it uh, an amp or you leave the choice to the engineer. Um, yeah, usually it, it depends on what the session is. You know, yeah. I, a bass that I, <laughs> am well known for playing is a, yeah, a ninth your yeah. beautiful bass <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's that yeah it's a yeah it's a, it's that green um 64 p bass 64. and that's and i think a lot of musicians they have a connection to yeah. an instrument and um whatever the instrument is it they can sound you. like themselves yeah and uh so that's that that is usually always with me and then but that is a strung with the flat wound no no but that's got no. it's ah, got okay. it's got just old old round oh. rounds ah yeah. okay interesting yeah very old and how much old not very old maybe a couple of years you know oh. two years <laughs> not marcus miller uh, way <laughs> no <laughs> no change every session <laughs> yeah yeah um, no so it's Two years and is it's enough. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, a couple of years, and then um, it's like a big record date where it's like bring a bunch of bases, bring a yeah. bunch of, and that and that does happen, you know. So I'll bring that. I'll bring, I'll bring maybe like three P bases. I'll bring okay. that P base. I'll bring another P base with flats. Okay. And then I'll bring another P base that I have that does have a newer sound. Okay. You know that has with has newer with, strings. With maple and maple neck. Yeah, Maybe. yeah, and then and then I've got a um, a seventy two jazz, and I'll bring that, and I'll I'll bring a jazz bass, and then I've got a jazz five string. That's that used to be my only bass for years and years. <laughs> okay. I bought it. I remember my bass was stolen in Denver. I had a bunch of basses stolen, but a bass was stolen, and I had to go buy a bass quickly for a gig when I was maybe nineteen. And this guy Mel Brown, that's a great bass player in Denver, was like, oh. "You should get a, you should get a Fender, 
you know, because I just had a PVTL5 and it was stolen. And I was only playing five strings because I loved Prince and I loved yeah. Sunny T Sunny and T. Yeah, the new power sure. generation. And so, yeah, I'll bring that five string, but I'll also bring a, a Hofner. Um, I've got one of those Hofner contemporary series. It's not an old Hofner. And I use that a lot. That's been getting used a lot. Um, I've got an, a Harmony H22, like an old one from the 60s. That's great. It's got a great sound. I've got a, a Gibson EB2, like one of the hollow bodies. Yeah. Sometimes I'll bring that. And a lot of times for me, I'll bring all these basses, but usually, you know, a lot of times the bass that I really speak with, with is the, the, the P bass. The P bass. But sometimes it's not right. Like I've got a music, a music man, like a 70s, like Bernard Edwards music ah. man, like 78, that's real bright, active. Yeah. And then I'll bring the upright bass. I've got two, uh, two uprights, um, one that's uh, seven eighths, um, that's got a C extension that okay. Lisa Gass made. It's a it's an old German bass, and um, that's got a real even sound, a real even sound to it. It's yeah. it it doesn't doesn't have a lot of wolf notes, and it sounds good arco. It isn't really loud, but it's got a nice good big even sound. And then I've got my old double bass. That's um, an old German bass. That's punchy it, and punchy and growly and makes weird like weird notes and. But it's it's got a vibe, you know. Okay. So, I'll bring this uh, like a an Ampeg um, B B12 uh, SB12 yeah. that I have. It's a flip top, and if it's a thing where a, an amp is needed, they'll just mic that, and then I'll go direct, and then I'll have the mics. If I need to bring a pre, I can bring this BAE DMP. I, B -A -E. I have this Tonecraft um, two I DI. A question: What about the tone of uh, of the P bass? Where do you put the tone? It depends. It used to be that the tone didn't work on my bass for years, ah. like oh. all the time. Yeah, so it was either on or off. It was either uh, there was no like you couldn't oh, roll it. It's bad. So it's just like it's like <laughs> and then you know and uh, yeah yeah no. yeah. <laughs> but uh, and and a lot of times yeah nowadays I I mean I took it to uh, I took it to someone maybe a year ago. Um, ah, yeah, okay. it, it was so, a year many, and a half ago. So many records we had done with the on off tone. On or off. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. And it's your, it's your hands. It's like where you put your hands, as you know, like yeah, where you, yeah. you know, where, where you put them. And, and um, sometimes when you open up uh, uh, the, the tone of P bass, uh, sometimes it loses something on the bottom. So, yeah uh, some engineer prefer that way because i have the brightness but uh, i i think that i lose something on the bottom of the p base usually have it all the way on it, okay. usually it's like rolled off it's usually rolled off at least like a quarter of the way 70 percent or or it's usually rolled off at least you know 30 percent. you know where it's just okay. like it's like that and then you know or halfway you know because okay. now I do have the variability. Like now I, I can kind of adjust it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah now, now you can. Now you can. Yeah. Uh, what's about the double bass? You, you studied in your school. Uh, how much is important for you for the work? And uh, you suggest to study it to the, all the people, all the bass players? Contrabass? Yes. Contrabasso? Yeah. Bass. Yeah, double bass for me was... Uh, yeah, I, I, I started when I was you know 19 i it, for me it was really important and it was it was it's you know it's a separate instrument in a lot of ways especially if, if you're like me that started on electric and i was comfortable on electric for so many years you know i was comfortable on electric for six years and then i started on upright bass double bass and i had to catch up and for me it really took me uh, at least another six years to feel comfortable you know to because it's it's just another it's another instrument Whoa. altogether it's like all of a sudden like we start tr you know trumpet you know it's like <laughs> yeah. Yeah. god you know it's like it's i love the double bass and i think that the modern bass players can have can have a voice on both and it takes maintenance like you're always kind of getting back to it and how much this is important for your electric bass touch too 
the strength uh, that came from the the studying the double bass yeah it's important it's really important like i i always played kind of i had a really strong right yeah. hand yeah. i always had a strong right hand and um some of my early influences was one of them was a bass player named lonnie marshall who is phenomenal bass player you know he just has such a strong a strong attack you know and i really when i was really young i really tried to play like that and i i i had to kind of move away from that because it's like that can for me it would kill the tone and it would kill the kill the overall sound and the note length like when i started understanding like the like you want to you want to have the attack but you know, you want the notes to be able to breathe and end yes, for sure you know but um yeah like the strength that it develops is important you know the that double bass playing does and then there's always approaches that that um that you learn on electric bass playing that really helps your double bass playing too because the typical methods that people learn you know the classic you know like semandel method is just like into first position and then just up the g string you know like beginning levels yeah whereas on electric bass you're learning across the neck everywhere i think they both inform each other you know like they're both we have done this wonderful uh, spotify playlist with all your music and uh, it's a week that uh, i listen uh, to to that so much you have played such a wonderful track and uh, with a wonderful tone so uh, oh, thank you choose uh, three of the wonderful songs they are gonna hear uh, with uh, with the playlist and uh, tell tell us about the um, all the gears and uh, some anecdotes of, uh, of the session what do you remember um i'm trying to remember what i put on there yes. but uh so many there is a collide uh, give you yeah, more well... Better days, still plays that we talked about. Oh yeah. Uh, un corpo okay. Anima. Uh, so okay. Many, so yeah. Great. Song. Yeah. Collide is one. So I I've been writing and been a you know really active in in writing songs and writing music and writing in the studio. Um, the song Collide was a song that uh, that I co-wrote with. Uh, a group of musicians and producers and that was really fun to put together the um, we had done a session we had done a set that that same group of people you know we played a lot of things over that beat like we started you know maybe we played like you know you know I don't know like we played different things but then that one was like you know and it just kind of settled into a group it felt like a nice groove and it has slight slight kind of differences here and there and then it kind of and then that became a piece that that the group earth gang wrote over with yeah. and that became a really great song and um yeah, for sure. there's a song. few songs yeah there's a few songs like that that um that came together that, or a lot of songs that come together that way but um there's that one there was what's another one what's another one you want me to talk about i got uh better days uh... Uh, give you more oh yeah cut to woman never mind with the becca stevens yeah never mind it was a, a, a her, her album that she put out is just beautiful it's called wonder her album's called wonder bloom and yeah. uh i co-wrote two of the songs on that album um okay. uh called good life and or never mind and uh that one was a real we had written around the bass and it was um and it was like a real chordal piece that is really uh that was really fun it just kind of spoke it has a real kind of corral in the middle of it that covers a lot of ground on on the instrument and um and it was really funny actually yesterday uh jonathan marin great bass player yeah he was supposed to or maybe he did maybe they did i think i think he was going on tour with becca <laughs> um and he had to play that song and he just yesterday he sent me a video of him he was just like i learned your tune and he just showed me like you know and it's like you know very, he's, very he's such a great bass player yeah but, yeah um, i know him from the group collective uh yeah yeah he was incredible with the, with the tone with the, his yamaha passive bass you are very active in arranging some writing and you have a very successful uh, band like uh, Nibody that uh, 
you writing original song. So how much uh, have a cre creative project improve your ability to do session and be a better session player? For me, they, they go together. You know, okay. for me, I, I really couldn't fully appreciate how important all of the roles were until like I was on the other side of on the other side of creating something and then I had so much more appreciation for what it took to make a record and I feel like I'm continually learning you know like you're just you're just always learning how to how to be better but um but yeah having having a band like Knee Body um being a part of a band I should say um of a band like Knee Body was was huge you know because you just learn you just learn a way that a group of musicians works together and, and makes music and and then that always goes on to inform the other project how much is important to play other instruments like guitar you, you play everything i i think for me it's really important if you want to become a producer um that's a real skill that's important to be able to play different instruments a lot of a lot of the a lot of the new successful producers that I know and I know of are like that. They, they're able to create productions just themselves. And it's a sad reality that the budgets for some projects are not what they used to be, where it's like you can hire a full band, you know, all the time. And, you know, that still happens if you're going to produce, you know, having a working knowledge of, of, guitar yeah. of piano of drums of you know and then you, and then you, you play have drums too you play drums I, I play you know i play i play my drums you know okay, like okay. i play but you you can play a, a, a legit song uh, entirely yeah you know you play yeah. you know you play i think yeah playing learning a new in instrument is is great and i think that once you've really developed your you know we're talking to bass players like you know, once you've developed your bass playing to a level that's to a really strong level, I think that when you learn other instruments, it comes back to your bass playing. Like you okay. start to, you start to Think go in into different ways. Yeah. There's a great drummer. Um, and now kind of he's becoming producer and, and, and he's a multi-instrumentalist named Abe Rounds. I don't know if you know Abe. He also plays great bass and, and great guitar. He sings and he's one of those super, okay. uh, prepared, <laughs> prepared guys. One thing he used to do was if he got called to play drums with a singer at a cafe, like singing, like he had to learn 10 songs for a singer songwriter okay. gig, like a gig. What he would do is, is when he was practicing, he would, he would learn, he would learn all the songs on his weakest instrument first. So like, you know, like, so it's a, you know, a, maybe guitar was his weakest instrument and he just like, he'd learn it on the guitar and then he'd learn it on the bass, you know, and then he'd learn it on the piano and then, and he would always be singing the song. And then by the time it was to like, you know, he is, his drumming is solid. His drumming is at such a, he just knows the music so well. And then he just knows the entire, like the entire makeup of the song as if he's produced it. You have played, uh, um, you have had to deal with such a great bass player, which is not so much common. Uh, Nate Wood, the drummer of your band, Nibody, play bass uh, in a such a God. good way. And then uh, you played with Sting with, uh, for uh, his musical. And uh, yeah. uh, at the end, uh, you played with, with the greatest, uh, Spino Palladino, with uh, the incredible live with John Lennon. So mm. what do you think uh, this incredible collaboration with another bass player has, uh, has uh, learned to you? It's strange, it's not happened so easily. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't happen often. For me, for me, a really big one was Nate because our band, Knee Body, uh, you know, started when Nate was 19 and I was 22, maybe 20. Okay. Or he played, you know, drums so well. It was like, oh my God, he just played so great. And he had such a uh, kind of a confident, really strong and presence. And sound, he has a, a flow, a sound that's unique. And then I remember he picked up my bass just for fun like for fun like we were at a cafe and he's just like let me, let me check this out like and he picked up my bass and just just played like four notes like four notes but it was like 
Oh my oh. God. Like, wow. <laughs> this guy is like the most, the, the most phenomenal musician I've ever played with. For me, it was a really great experience to, to play so many years with him and just to know how amazing he is at the bass. Like I literally, sure. I'm like, why am I here? You know, why? You know, like, because you're just so good. He tell you something when you play the group together, he plays something? Yeah, sometimes, sometimes there would be some things like, you know, and his feedback would mean a lot to me. Like if okay. he really, if he liked what like I was it, doing, yeah, you know, sure. it would, it would be like, you know, that kind of a thing. I can understand that. Can but, understand. but getting to meet um, Pino and work with him was incredible too. Anytime you're, you're getting to work with, with bass players like that, there's, there's a real understanding. Like you kind of, yeah, you know, yeah, you, yeah, you there is a brotherhood. <laughs> yeah, brotherhood, you kind of cut through a lot of things and, and getting to be in the studio with, with other great bass players is always really interesting. I love seeing how they approach a situation. Okay. And I find myself thinking about what I saw them do. I learn a lot from them. And you, know? you played with Michel, one of the few more groovy and tight uh, bass player of the 90s. I, I, I remember the first time I heard the Plantation Lullabies. It was, Me it was, too. It was a, a rocket in my face. I was uh, blasted. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Yeah. And it was actually my friend Josh uh, Lopez who showed me that album back oh, when it oh, came oh. out. She's such an incredible artist and she's such a, um, an amazing, just, you look at all the albums that she's made in her career and they're always, they're, they're so different, but they're always, so good. <laughs> but they're always so good. And they're always so her, like, it's just her, like you, you couldn't be anybody else to make this record. Like every single, you know, she's an incredible person. And I, I just, I love Michelle so much. I, you know, I've learned so much from her and I, she's just such a great, a great person and such a fierce bass player. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, she's so good. Yeah. You talk about uh, the, your time in Italy. We, uh, let's talk about your experience with Luciano Ligabue. Uh, let's talk about Italy. What do you think about uh, our, our nation? Well, in Italia, per me è stato un sogno. Poter vedere e conoscere, um, imparare un paese, una cultura, una lingua come, come la vostra. È, è stato un piacere della mia vita. E, e soprattutto di poter farlo con un artista come Luciano. Con, come, come un artista, come una persona, un uomo, è un, un gran bel persona molto presente eh, e anche tutti gli altri musicisti. Per me è, è stata un'opportunità che uh, è successo tipo d'un tratto. Uh, un giorno il nostro gruppo Nibadi abbiamo avuto fatto un tour in Italia e tipo due settimane dopo con le, le, le immagini fresche della mia mente del vostro paese tipo ah, che bello di vedere Catan Catanzaro oppure uh, Bolzano, Milano, Roma eccetera yeah. c'era un chiamato di un produttore uh, Corrado Rustici che mi ha, ha trovato il mio nome da un altro bassista da lì è iniziato un'avventura tipo yeah. lui mi ha chiesto uh, forse uh, ti, ti sarei interessato di lavorare con questo artista molto conosciuto in Italia e ho fatto sarebbe, sarebbe interessante uh, per me di essere un musicista americano non, non ho sentito il suo, la sua musica però yeah. ho conosciuto che dovrebbe essere importante per yeah. un sacco di persone e per me forse questo, questo è un, una cosa di dire a tutti i bassisti di quando un artista ti, chia ti chiama e se non hai, non hai sentito, non lo hai sentito prima, tu devi arrivare uh, preparato, preparato e, e con il rispetto, il rispetto che questo artista ha lavorato molto per guadagnare i fedeli di un sacco di persone. E se io arrivassi così, ah, boh, non è importante, solo, è, è solo un concerto, 
sarebbe una cosa brutta di fare. E per me è stato un, un capitolo, un capitolo incredibile della mia vita. What, what, per... what is your most beautiful memory? What, what concert you are uh, involved the most uh, you remember? Per me ricordo, ricordo una, una notte a Verona, dove, dove abbiamo, abbiamo fatto uh, sette notti in arena. Yeah. C'è un disco di, disco, del nostro, yeah. concer sì. nostro concerto. Durante, durante questa settimana abbiamo avuto uh, una festa con l'orchestra. Uh, allora c'era un, uh, un feeling molto forte uh, entrambi uh, nostri. E dopo, alla fine di quella sera, alla festa, all'arena, dopo il concerto, il nostro manager uh, alla fine ha detto tipo, ok, tutti abbiamo uh, 15 minuti per andare a Correggio, dove, dove eravamo in hotel. Okay. E io e il tasterista abbiamo fatto, boh, perché non stare qui stasera? Tipo, abbiamo un camerino. Abbiamo un camerino che è più bello della nostra casa. A casa, un camerino. Avete dormito nell'arena? Sì. Dentro l'arena proprio? Sì. Oh! Sì. <ride> incredible. Oh. That's tipo, tipo, a, a tre, tre della notte sul palco, tipo, <ride> sotto le stelle. I know, yeah. I know. Indimenticabile. No. Indimenticabile. <ride> e, ma, ma tutta l'esperienza con, con lui è stata incredibile. Io credo che ho vero amici lì e, e ha cambiato la mia vita. Non ho parlato due parole di italiano prima di andare lì, allora... <ride> lo, lo parli benissimo, molto meglio del mio inglese. <ride> no, dai, dai. No, per me, per, per me uh, ti, ti dicevo, ogni volta che sento italiano nella strada qui negli Stati Uniti, fa, io faccio... Scusa! <ride> di, dove sei? Di, di, di dove, dove sei? sei? Sì, allora. Cave, you have my CD, I, I, I'll send you, so let me know about it. It's, I told you one time and you make a laugh because uh, I call the name song. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I yeah. Write, yeah. Sometimes I need to write some Nam song, uh, but uh, why not? I love <laughs> Nam songs. Yeah, I love yeah. those. Yeah. To talk about your solo CD that uh, um, the last one hunted uh, this way uh, is was released the, the, the last year. So yeah. Tell us about the CD. We put the link. I put out, in the last two years, I put out two albums. So in 2018, I put out Light of Love. Yeah. And, and then 2019, I put out Haunted This Way. In reality, uh, Haunted This Way was finished already while I was making Light of Love. And for me, that was an album that it took, Haunted This Way took a long time for me to make because It was so personal. A lot of the, a lot of the feelings in the songs were really personal. But there was also uh, being uh, like a supporting member of so many musical projects, like like we are as bass players. Um, it for me, it was hard to come out from under that. And then, because we play different roles in our career, you know, we, you know, certain people know you for certain things, and other people know you for other things. But when it comes to your own music and your own album, that is you saying, this is me. This is what I'm doing. It's a picture, a picture of you. Exactly. And so for me, uh, Haunted This Way was an incredible gift to make. Um, it's with a great band with um, mostly Jay Bellarose on the drums, but also um, there's some drumming from A. Browns, who I talked about. He plays on the song Haunted This Way, as well as uh, Gene Coy, a great drummer out cool. here yeah. and then um matt chamberlain plays on a song too and um and then also there's uh larry goldings on the keyboards and ah, yeah. tim young plays guitar as well as my friend josh lopez who i told you about and um it was just really fun to i'm singing and, and playing uh you know wrote the songs And for me, I was inspired by, um, I was just inspired by a lot of like Plastic Ono band, David, or uh, John Lennon, John Lennon yeah. records. And just the, 
kind of the sounds of those records. And um, yeah, so that was really fun. It was a fun record to make, you know, and it's fun. And when I play uh, concerts, I'll, I'll play, I play some of those songs live or solo. We hope to see you live with your band in Italy. So I can't, non vedo l'ora, non vedo l'ora. We, we of the Bust Your Life community uh, we came all over there, uh, wh Good. wherever you play. <laughs> that would be great. I, yeah, I can't wait to meet everybody. You do uh, online lesson from, uh, from home? Yeah, I, you know, I used to teach more but um i i would love to teach i would love i'm always available for for online lessons i don't get called for them that often but but at the same time if if somebody wants to take a lesson i'm i'm always there it'd be so, great and you can practice italian too so it's yeah occasion so yeah I talk to all the bus player out there to to came to you and what what are the topics you talk about in your lesson you know i had a I had a student last year where we did talk, we had a specific plan okay. with him. I want, I want them to have, I want a student to have a set of goals. So okay. if it's wanting to work on your writing, if it's wanting to work on certain aspects of your playing, I, I think, I think all of the, the really important things to learn are, are like, I want to try to cover in my lessons. But one, one thing that I really like talking about is, uh, something is developing a rep like for a bass player to develop a repertoire of songs that they can play by themselves. So, um, you know, the, the ability to either compose a song or to learn a song and compose and to come up with the accompaniment that they can play by themselves. And there's melody and, and the bass, uh... melody and bass, you know, and, and it can Naima could be one of the first. <laughs> God, I know, I know exactly. It probably stems from that story of just the, uh, yeah, like yeah. never wanting to make that mistake again, you know, like, just like if I was back in that room, what would I play? <laughs> you should do the open E string and do the melody. Dove, <laughs> dove c'eri, dove c'eri quel giorno. <laughs> yeah. So. Cave, it was a great pleasure to talk with you. I, I, I could listen to you for hours because you have so much experience, but uh, I know all the, the guys can now understand how much <laughs> there is after that great bass player they have seen with Luciano on stage because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there is a, a world, your music, your band, all the collaboration you have done. So it's uh, it's a treasure thank you for sharing this with the, all, all the guys uh, uh, mario it's it was it was such a pleasure to to talk with you leave us with the two advice for a bass player out there to become one of the top session player of the world as oh my God. you are i mean my advice is to is to always always keep putting yourself in positions to get better you know, put yourself, play with musicians that are, at, that are better than you, you know, surround yourself with people that are better than you and put yourself in positions that make you, that might make you uncomfortable, but make you better. And always uh, try to appreciate this, the small victories, you know, getting to, getting to the high, high levels is all relative, you know, like just getting to, you should be really satisfied just getting to wake up and play the bass. Like that's just such an amazing feeling. This time are uh, very precious wo words for everybody. When you want to talk Italian, uh, you, you know my, my number. And, uh, okay, me. okay. Uh, uh, for Grande. Night, no problem. <laughs> Grande. Ci sarò. Ci sarò. Thanks so much for this opportunity. This, no, this, this, this was really nice to hear from you. Have a okay. good night. Buona notte. Dormi bene. Sogni d'oro.